Hey, it's Mike Henry. Welcome back. I'm here with my good friend Steve Ag. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Good to be here. I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. Yeah, ATC. What's ATC? All things considered. Oh yeah, yeah. Duh. <laughs> we have a good time. <laughs> so Steve and I have known each other for gosh about twenty years, I think. Easily um, twenty years. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah, I think it was around ninety nine, two thousand. We met. Oh my God. Yeah. My brother Patrick and I were directing some commercials for a friend, yeah. Cabo Harris, back east, yeah. and uh, they were for the Virginia Anti-Smoking, the whatever. Virginia Tobacco Settlement Foundation. That's what it says on the check stubs, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so anyway, still get them once in a while. Do you? Yeah. All right. So we cast Steve. Uh, there was a, a character called Butt Man, <laughs> and uh, my friend Cabo came up with with this uh, chain kind of smoking soup. Superhero, the world's most pathetic superhero. Yeah, America's most pathetic superhero. Another day in the life of Buttman. Kids, they love me. Get out of here! And then, of course, there are the ladies. Excuse me, it's emergency. Ah, there we go. <laughs> the problem solved. How you doing? That's my life. <laughs> Not for everyone. Isn't smoking stupid? So we met Steve doing Butt Man, and um, uh, we became good friends. Uh, Can I just tell you? Yes. So my agent calls me with this audition. She's like, we have this audition for you. This is one of my first acting gigs. I'd done like a Pacific Bell commercial, I think, and that was it. Yeah, we could tell. And she goes... Just kidding. She goes, we have this audition for you. It's non-union. It's a buyout, like five grand or, or something shoots in Richmond, Virginia. And at that time, I had a massive fear of flying, like massive. Okay. And so I, in my head, was immediately like, I'm not doing it. And so I went to your audition, didn't give a shit. I was like, I'm not going to fucking try. <clears throat> I'm just going to fucking go through the motions. And so I just did it like totally, blah, blah, which apparently was really good for Buttman. And I got home, and they're like, you got the part. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> also, yeah. I don't smoke. And it was, even though it, you know I'm constantly smoking cigarettes, they're herbal cigarettes. Right, on set, yeah. And they're freaking horrible. Yeah. It, they taste so bad, and it feels just like you're smoking. Well, we, uh, you were hilarious. Nice. And <laughs> we were, you know, when you're auditioning people, it can be long and tedious. Because yeah. as soon as you see what... You know, yeah. you got to sit through a lot of stuff just to be polite. Sure. And then you came in and and cracked our ass up. And That's um, so funny. So we flew to flew you to Virginia, and you were hilarious. And you didn't you get very sick after that? You were smoking cigarettes. We in shot like, for like five or six days. Yeah, in the rain, mostly outdoors in February. Yeah. So it was freezing, and I am wearing like lycra, and like I don't have a. You guys are all wearing your you know parkas. Canada Canadian goose <laughs> parkas right and I was freezing and one yeah. of the last days we were shooting was indoors and I was supposed to be running on a treadmill with right. like a green screen behind me right and I passed out yeah I got home and <laughs> I had pneumonia well let's <laughs> let's cut to the happy ending of it all you've gotten several more checks than you expected well yeah it was a buy it's like five grand and I didn't know it was like you're going to shoot for like a week and they're going to cut like nine spots out of it. And I'm like, Oh, that seems like they're getting the good deal. <laughs> and then that was like 99, 2000 cut to years later. I'm working on Kimmel. I'm doing research on Jimmy Kimmel show and I have not acted in forever. And I get a call from my agent, ex agent, my commercial agent going, Hey Steve, um, it's me. I need your mailing address. I need to know if it's different or new. Um, we have a check for you. They wanted to start running those ads again. And so they renegotiated a deal. So I was thinking I was probably going to get another five grand. Mm -hmm. And so I give them my address. And like a week later, I got a check for $23,000. There you go. But man. But man lives. Best money I've made on a commercial bank ever. Bank man. Yeah, bank man. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, man. So then then you turned us on to Channel 101. 
And yes. uh, Patrick and I did a thing called Kicked in the Nuts, which you are in. So we met a whole bunch of Dan Harmon, Rob Schrab, yeah, Andy Samberg, all those guys, Chris yeah. Tallman, uh, yeah. what was it, Time Belt. Like there were all these cool yeah. things that people were doing. And you would make like an up to a five minute short film that would be screened. You had to at make a it theater. as if you were making a TV show with the hopes of it getting picked up yes. for a quote series. Yes. So you could so you had to serialize your short film. Yes. So the top five would get another yeah. uh, another month. And so uh that was great fun. And uh you guys but, had like a very early um viral video with kicked in the nuts we had like millions of videos that's one of that the was like first viral videos dude that was like 2001 2002 yeah and uh yeah so yeah i mean that was before the lonely island uh chronicles of narnia viral video i had friend random friends who i had not seen in years who were like sending me the link going have you seen this i'm like i'm in this right what are you insane right um yeah so that all worked and then is it still online kicked in the nuts yeah oh yeah kicked in the nuts.com kicked in the nuts.com check it out check it out yeah we had a good time with that patrick really got behind that he made me shoot like 20 some episodes and we got we got a little bit of financing and so we built a website and he did all that stuff i it, just showed up and complained. It even we was so popular it worked its way into family guy yeah and we did <laughs> seth mcfarland seth green all you know all kinds of people from family That's guy right. Um, and then, so then recently we shot, um, or recently, shit, it's been seven years since Has I it shot been a pilot seven years where you play my brother, Timmy and it's been seven years. Yeah. Made you come to Richmond again. That's so, ins- Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. So you play my younger brother who lives with our mom, who you call mommy, mommy. and, it's uh, so wrong. Yeah. And, uh, that, that was great fun. And that, that, that was a pilot that I shot. On my own, you funded the I whole thing. Paid man. for it. I wrote it, starred in it, directed it. You know, brought in producers and yeah. uh, brought in you and some other people from L.A. Yeah. And you know, I thought it was pretty darn good. It wasn't. It, was good. it wasn't perfect, but it was. Um, and we almost sold it. Uh, yeah. But sometimes, you know, I would much rather have done that than yeah. go through two years of development at yeah. a studio. Hundred percent. Because I saw what it would take to do it, and I did it. And now I know how I would do you it better. It. That's like the, you know, I know so many people here that are like, I have this idea for a show. Yeah. Everyone I know has an idea for a show and nothing ever happened. It never gets beyond, I have this idea for a show. Yeah. Like you were like, yeah, I have an idea and I'm going to do it. Well, early on, I when I set out to make comedy, I just did it. I, I did commercial parodies that I would I would shoot. I would find a way to get it shot, keeping equipment yeah. for an extra day after a real shoot, like a, a commercial or something, yeah. calling favors, whatever. And I remember distinctly this old sound editor in, in Virginia just said to me, you know, the difference between you and everybody else is you actually do the shit. Yeah. So that's At my advice. At what point in all of person. that were you doing the the Lorne Michaels, what was the college? Burley Bear. Burley Bear Network stuff. Yeah, So, um, so in the chronology of things, I came out here cold in 1990, ended up doing stand-up and PA work and yeah. writing classes and Groundlings classes, all that kind of stuff. Went yeah. back to Virginia and shot said commercial parodies. My brother uh, went to RISD, and so I acted in his films. And so we, we, made, we made a lot of short films, and some of them got to Lorne Michaels' people, and they hired us to do... Uh, interstitials for this college cable network they had called the Burley Bear Network. And that was at a lot of different colleges, right? They had, it was old school. It was like they literally would send a tape of programs to 600 different schools and those schools would play that tape on their local closed circuit cable channel. And what we were hired to do was the in-between stuff. The Anything, it had to be 30, 60, 90, or 120 seconds.
your number so maybe we can go out sometime? us money we went and shot and came up with all this great stuff and um and shot it and it you know you can find that on uh, i guess it's on crosseyetv.com some funny stuff man and um yeah so it, it was just making the stuff making stuff and then then we had a shot at a midnight movie we had a deal to make a sketch film with lauren and um mtv films and we just fucked it up we fucked up the script Oh, it, really? They wanted just straight up Kentucky Fried Movie reboot, and we tried to give it a narrative through line, and then, right. you know, my brother and I's family dysfunction started coming out and <laughs> everything, and it was it just turned into a nightmare, yeah. and it was funny, and it was, uh, you know, a very original script that it was sort of a, a guy's, you know, whatever, philosophical journey into figuring out who he is. And within that, there are dreams of, Sketch. of sketches. And those are all sketches. And, like yeah. we had Titty Bank. Uh, we wanted to do a commercial where all the, the topless tellers, like just very straight up corporate. Oh, you know, the 90s, but, man. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that was one of the best things in the script. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So That's so funny. Just on the quest, constantly on a quest to do my own thing, hence we're sitting here and nobody's yeah. telling channel 101 was the same thing you know dan Harmon and rob schraub and myself and a few other friends used to i mean before channel 101 late 90s would just hang out and we would you know we'd make weird videos of ourselves like short films and and then every sunday we'd get together at rob's house and just show them and laugh and get stoned and yeah um that's how Channel 101 started. It was like, we got to keep doing this. And and this was at a time where one of us had a video camera. So you'd have to borrow someone's video camera. And like, yeah, a lot of people had to edit in camera because you had you to know, have an avid. Yeah. Or get access to an avid. Yeah. Then iMovie came in and kind of. Yep. Now everyone can make shit. I remember when iDVD came out and I could burn my own demo DVDs. Yeah. That was revolutionary. I was so excited. I had a DVD burner too. Yeah. God, I think I still have it in storage. It's just like. Hey, get it, burner. Burner. We get it. Sense Amelia. Oh, we get the kind. Ja. The kind. Oh, yeah, man. Is this, guy, is this guy's stuff in again? Oh, he's got the kind. The kind. He's got the kind. Oh, I remember Reefer. Uh, remember I remember Illegal like it was weed. last night. <laughs> Good name for a movie or a band. Illegal Weed. Illegal Weed. All right. You were in bands. I was in a lot of bands. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. Yeah. So you grew up in the Northwest. No, I grew up an hour east of here in Riverside, California. But did you spend time up like in Oregon or something? I lived in Ashland, Oregon in the late 90s for a year. Okay. Um, so what was your journey? Like, so you tell me about growing up. 10 years old, I I found Dr. Demento, uh, the Dr. Demento show, Sunday nights. It was a syndicated radio show, all comedy, but it was every form of comedy. He had like an hour or two on Sunday nights where he would play like Weird Al and George Carlin out, like stand-up albums, sketch albums, musical parody albums. On the radio. Yeah, and I had just been given, I think for my birthday – a transistor radio with a mono earplug. Oh yeah! And so my parents would make me go to bed on Sunday nights, and I would. I thought that was a butt plug. That came no, on. no, no! It was too small. And so Sunday I nights, it smelled so bad. Sorry. I would. They'd make me go to bed, and then I would quietly take out the transistor radio, and I would listen to Doctor Demento and just laugh. And I thought it was so amazing. And um, when I was eleven. I, the very first album I bought with my own money was George Carlin, A Place for My Stuff. Like, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. And then I saw Three's Company on TV. My parents let me watch Three's Company. And I thought John Ritter was the funniest person in the world. He's not as pretty as Lou, I'll tell you that. I know all aspects. <laughs> <laughs> He was my idol. He's the reason I wanted to become an actor. So I knew I wanted to be an actor and a stand-up comedian. But 
I grew up in Riverside. I nobody in my family was on the creative side, and I was just like, I guess I can't do that. Right. And then when I was like in college and like eighteen, where was that? Loma Linda University in the Inland Empire. Um, private school. It's usually it's mostly a pre med school, but they had like um, I. W- do you have your Sorry. vibrator on? I don't have it on. You I don't know. know. I, I literally it. have this the new iPhone, and I don't know how to turn it to vibrate. It doesn't. It doesn't want have you the little switch. It doesn't have the switch on the side. There is no turning it off. Um, but I was a biology major my first year and f- was failing miserably. My mom was the one who cut out uh, two things: an open mic thing in the back of the paper, at this place called the Laugh Stop in in uh, Ontario, California. And so I went and did stand up at an open mic, loved it. How old were you? 18? I was 18. All right. And then she also cut out auditions for the Riverside community players were putting on a production of A Christmas Carol. And I was just like, uh, I didn't know about auditioning. I didn't know headshots. I just went to the audition. Kind of like butt man. Yes, I didn't have a headshot, nothing. And audition for just like the smallest role, and I went home, and like an hour later, the director called me. She's like, "I want you to play Jacob Marley," and that was like my first acting gig. And that was a five thousand dollar buyout as well. That was a zero dollar <laughs> buyout. It was for the experience, Mike. Right. <laughs> and uh, the acting, you know, that was that for years. But I would still do stand up off and on, and then I. I joined my roommate's band in college, and um, what kind of music was that? And you, it was like you kind bass? of a lot of covers, Did but you a play lot of bass? yeah, played bass, a lot of rock covers, punk, and um, after I graduated, I ended up getting an art degree, and after I graduated, I didn't know what to do with it. Painting degree? I don't. You don't. What the fuck do I do? I can paint a picture. Great. You know what we do? We tell jokes. We have a good time. You know what? I like to um, I like to just sit and have conversations with my friends. I don't. You do. I, I don't like to. You love to talk. I, I like. To you're the only. Interact. You're one of the only. You're one of like two or three people I know that call on the phone. I know. I knew. And I'm always that. like, what, what the, the fuck? fuck is he calling? Yeah. I usually <laughs> equate like a phone call with like bad news. Like, right. Hey, uh, yeah. Jim's dying. Did you hear about it? It's <laughs> like, oh shit! I, I'm not going to answer this because it's going to yeah. be sad. What would you say if I called you? How would you answer the phone typically? No way. No way. No way. So uh, that started on set of the Buttman. Yeah, that was something An- from your past. Another. Uh, oh yeah, I remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, years ago, I was in in a, a, a failing relationship, and I was like, "All right, we'll sit down and watch a movie together." And then it was like the most predictable, stupid fucking yeah. movie. And then when the predictable, fucking stupid thing happens, I just went, "No way!" <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. Um, but the Buttman shoot, I remember we were so Buttman's character was just a pathetic, you know. Yeah, pr- pr- pretty low rent kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, so you're in your you're in your butt man apartment, oh. brushing your teeth, and we oh. were we were in basically a crack den that, as a location. It was usually filthy. on a, a a union commercial. It would be on a stage, right, or in a real house, and it would be nice set dressed, yeah, to look shitty, right. This was like a crack house this was there was there were dirty handprints over the toilet on one side where clearly somebody was leaning to take a piss um but as you're brushing your teeth as part of the script i'm like okay i'm directing you off camera and i'm like all right grab go go ahead and grab the toothbrush blah 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 and you put it in your mouth i'm like no not that one <laughs> and you went what and then uh then everybody's laughing and i won't say what you said <laughs> um yeah but uh, it was funny. Um, that was such a sketchy apartment. Like I walked in, I was like, "Wow, you guys did a great job!" And I'm like, 
we didn't do anything. Yeah, we, all we did was show up, Steve. We just put lights in here. <laughs> yeah, we, we flushed the toilet. That's all we did. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Oh, hey, remember Old Man Weeks? Sure, the guy with one arm at the liquor store. Yeah, now he's got no nothing. He got hit by a train last week. Did he die? Yeah, he died. Uh, Does your window roll down? That definitely doesn't roll down. Mm. Didn't you go out with old man Weeks' daughter? Sort of. I was mean, kind of hanging out, but she was real Christian. She wouldn't even let me finger her. But one night after an REM concert, we was back at her parents' house on the couch, and she was like, I'll let you put a toe in me. I towed her. Wow. Towed the wet sprocket? <laughs> toe jam? I towed, any, other, any other bands we could come up with I on that? Towed the wet pocket. Count it. Thank you. <laughs> you can use that on your show if you want. I will use it on the show. Yeah, so that was a scene from Home on the Strange, the pilot shot in the fall of 2016. And wow. that didn't sell in the spring of 2017. Why? But uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I like the pace of it. I'm just going to go ahead and turn the TV off. Um, I like the pace. I like the realness of You're it. You're a good actor, man. Yeah, you too. Thanks, bud. Hey. Thanks, bro. That was all pretty much improvised. A lot of that was and improvised. I think it might have been a true story that you were uh, alluding no. to. I mean, I did go to an REM concert. <laughs> you didn't tow the wet no, rocket. no. Uh, but yeah, so that was fun. So we were on the back of a flatbed, uh, driving around in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we just had that locked off two shot and you and I were, or we played brothers Yeah. and my character is a TV star who is unfulfilled doing scatological humor, but having a nice career yeah. of it. And then he gets a call from you who, uh, the younger brother who lives with mommy yeah. and basically old money that you've blown all of but you're still hanging on to the country club membership <laughs> yeah and that's so oh, that's right yeah, yeah so we were on the way to the club to investigate because you had a theory that i had fathered a child with a woman that you had seen at the club the yes. night before oh, i totally forgot all yeah this. and so it was now a teenage child and i was coming home looking for you know meaning and trying to connect yeah. with uh with with my my sperm so uh that was so funny yeah but it was it's so fun to work with you and i i actually have a, <laughs> an, a, a version of the I, I love the the character dynamics here yeah and um you know I, i'm gonna come to you at some point I, I wrote a movie a few years ago that i am not ready to move forward with but you're you're in it and i think i told you about that and, and i want yeah, you I, yeah. I love that dynamic i think all that stuff at the country club too was really funny yeah that's a that real a place. Real country club. That's too. a real place. I mean, yeah. it's um, it's an amazing little pocket of of culture here, that just sort That's of right. is there. Um, and as this as this series would have progressed, you know, we're making fun of a lot of these country club folks, but you would have gotten to know them a little bit and yeah. You know, that's the that's probably the least per you know the the group of people that you're rooting for the least in general because yeah. they have money and and it's privilege a and deep well of characters to pull from at that country club but they have pain and you know problems yeah. and you know yeah, family totally. dynamics just yeah. like everybody else so i thought that would have been an interesting thing to do in that series yeah but hey fuck it didn't sell fuck shit shit i, I was um talking with david gordon green the director who's yeah. uh, I'm, I'm friendly with and leading up to this He's like, yeah, just go ahead and shoot it. He's like, at the at least you, you know, the worst thing that'll happen is you'll have something cool you can show your friends. Yes. So he's not I have wrong. something cool I can show my friends. He's not wrong. Uh, I wonder if I what I should do with that. Should I just put it online, you know, just somewhere, yeah. or just have screen a screening of it somewhere? Just you do I, both. I want to do something with it. There's a lot of funny scenes in there. I'm so stoked that you made it. You know, I. I, I have friends and we'll like hang out and like get high and watch like really bad low budget movies that no one has ever seen or heard, like not even direct to video. And I'm just like, I don't even know where he finds these. And every time I'm watching them in the back of my head, I'm like, this is garbage, 
but somebody like actually made it. Someone like went through with writing it, found money to make it. Maybe obviously not a lot, but like they did it, and they probably had a blast doing it. You and, are making me feel so good about this. And now it's up there, and it's like I am so proud, so impressive that any any time someone makes something, I'm like, that's fucking amazing. You I've just, never done it. Steve, you just called this garbage. No, no. I say we watched garbage. But this made you think of that. Yeah, because you made it yourself. What are you, what are you saying, It's Steve? not garbage. All right. I mean, you made a TV pilot. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. You're backpedaling. This I have is hurtful, an, you know? I have an idea. <laughs> you made it. That's fucking amazing. Yeah. I have a lot of ideas that'll fucking never see the light of day. All right. I've been going through a demolition derby phase. Okay. Have you I've, been? I've never been to one. I've always wanted, ever since Happy Days. Happy Days. The That's Malachi hilarious. Crunch. Uh, Fonzie and Leather Tuscadero te- right. teaming up in a demolition derby against the Malachi brothers. Well, the Malachi brothers would pull their signature move. The Malachi Crunch. They'd be on either side of the car, and they'd both slam into the car. It. Yep. But, as I recall, Fonz, was it the Fonz, or was it Richie who pulled the move at the end? Fonzie. So he, at the last second, got out of the way, and the Malachis and crunched each other. into each other. You know what? Fuck those Malachis. Oh. Uh, have you met, you, you probably know Henry Winkler, or you probably met him in met comedy him circles. I did an episode of Children's Hospital. Mm-hmm. And um, he wasn't in that episode, but he was there for like a fitting or something. And I got to sit next to him at the at lunch break. And uh, he was so fucking nice, man. He is the nicest man. Holy shit! I I I have a friend. My friend Scott went to school. Was in the same grade as his son Jed. Was it Scott Stapp? No, nope. okay. Scott, Scott Chernoff. Right and I go. And I, I didn't know if he would even Scott remember. Chernoff. Scott Chernoff was in Kicked in the Nuts. Yes. Played the I, pizza guy. Yes, he was a pizza guy. And I go, I just turned to him, I go, um, I'm friends with Scott Chernoff. And I was going to remind him who Scott, and he's like, oh, my God, Scott, I love Scott. He was friends with my son, Jed. And I was like, yeah. you he, Scott said you gave him a like a Swiss Army pocket knife at, when they graduated. Nice. Still has it. Henry Winkler I met at Rob Hubel's wedding. So uh, Rob and I lived in New York um, back before Family Guy happened. And so I met, it was, gosh, it was probably almost 10 years ago. And uh, I would not met Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler was the officiant at the wedding. So he married Rob and, yeah, and his wife. And so, yeah, and so... um, so afterwards, hanging out, whatever, just to, in a pocket full of people having a conversation, I feel these hands on my hips just kind of moving me over gently. And it was Henry Winkler just sort of hugging me and kind of coming into the conversation. I was just like, this is the coolest motherfucker. The Fonz. The nicest guy in the world. And you know what? He's a grateful man, and that's why he's a happy man. And you meet Absolutely. these people who are full of gratitude. The biggest mm-hmm. stars, I've, you know, like... Earth, Wind, and Fire I got to work with um, on the Cleveland show. Whoa. Those guys are nothing but gratitude. Just positive. You know, they're making me feel like I'm the star. Yeah. That, that's what these people do. Brian Cranston did that when he came on uh, the Cleveland show. He was yeah. a regular on there or had a recurring on there. But every time he showed up, he made you feel good. And that's what Henry Winkler did. And, you know, that's something to aspire to. I was in <clears throat> Colorado and Seth and Claire were there and we were at the same hotel and we were there for a wedding, but Brian Cranston there was there for something totally different. We come down the elevator and it opens and he's there and Seth says, hello, they give each other a big hug and he introduced me and he was so incredibly nice and kind. And yeah. His book is great. Have you, uh, no. he recently, I think my mom gave it to me. It's a life in parts. I believe it's what it's called. Yeah. Awesome autobiography. Um, it talks about Seinfeld. Sure. Yeah, he talks about his his childhood, his everything else. And you know what else is interesting? He his childhood, as all of ours do. He he talks about how that just set his trajectory for life and his worldview. Really. And um, yeah. And then to the point where late in life, he and his siblings 
had a joint therapy session and it all it just became abundantly clear how each of them had their trajectory was set from you know their childhood experience oh wow i yeah. gotta read that <clears throat> it's really cool and bono too we saw um uh bono do his book tour thing uh downtown la right everything that he sings about every, everything he does is based on his childhood yeah. and you know it's true for all of us so yeah. so people fucking deal with your childhood shit and you know you'll be happy move on and be grateful yeah but, smile once in a while yeah if you don't like your place in the world go complain to the three-year-old with cancer <laughs> that's what somebody once told I'll me i'll give I'm you like, his address all right <laughs> fuck it what is yeah, his address? true who is it there's sadly there's a lot i know but just fucking be grateful that's that's how i, I agree yeah i'm grateful for our friendship steve i'm grateful you you brought your ass over here today me too you know i'm i'm, I'm glad you immediately yeah. said i can't wait let's do it i can't you know there's a lot of shit i could complain about but i'm very lucky so i'm like yeah you know i'll just uh complain about it to myself yep yep um sort of a non sequitur but pulling off my coffee table book that i got surely you can't be serious this is all about the zucker brothers and jim abrams writing airplane and uh so i live on the west side and i saw that they were going to be at this bookstore doing a signing the next night so yeah. i called john viner and we went over there together uh and <laughs> shook hands with with jerry zucker and whatever and so i got this audio book as well and have been listening to it and i just finished it last night it is so fucking inspiring Who's um, doing the audio? Is it they both are. of them? All, all, all of them. Of them? If you, yeah, if you look at the book, it's like different quotes from different people talking about different periods of their journey. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. So they all grew up in Wisconsin and had yeah. a Kentucky Fried Theater. and Kentucky Fried moved, Movie. Moved it to L.A. Yeah. and then did Kentucky Fried Movie and, of course, Airplane. And just talking about all of their experiences in life and how that, you know, all they wanted to do was be funny and make people laugh. And so yeah. they did that. And, you know airplane is just a freaking classic there's all kinds of people on there too bill Hader is on there and they have a lot of the producers from on the audio book there yeah just and, and in this book too just being quoted on trey parker and matt stone wow um, who uh did basketball i guess with i think david zucker um but uh it's really cool and it's so inspiring and it's yeah. the, the poignant thing for me is that later in life like there's sort of an epilogue where um you know they're they're just sort of chilling out and then uh jim abrams talks about up until he was 49 all he wanted to do was make people laugh and then he had he got married and had a baby that had epilepsy yeah. and so he just devoted his life to you know he stumbled across or research and found the optimum diet for people with with that and talks about how modern medicine does not encourage yeah. any of that kind of stuff but it it really it was uh sort of a mature you know, the, the young stuff is all fun, smoking weed and topless ladies, and they just want to be funny and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And they did this amazing thing that's so influential. But then later in life, you know, their purpose changed. And I thought yeah. that was really cool because, you know, I don't know. Penis, penis, penis. Did your, <laughs> did did your life change? I mean, obviously, after having kids. Absolutely. So all I wanted to do, I was so driven to be funny. Yeah. I, I you know in high school and stuff and yeah. all through I was just a class clown and just whatever and then when I decided to do it professionally that's all I focused on yeah. Any, anything else was secondary any other kind of relationship or whatever all I wanted to do was get my comedy out there and figure right. out how to make fun of the status quo and yep. commercials in particular which I just yeah. find you know uh, offensive uh, <laughs> that they're just presented as this happy shit and you know they're showing you a puppet while they're trying to take your wallet yeah. Um, but yeah I was so driven and then I was on my way to SNL I really wanted to be on SNL and then Family Guy happened and this was you know eight years into my journey so it was all I, all I would do was smoke weed at night, write funny shit, figure out who I needed to do, you know, yeah. get involved to make the stuff, yeah. and I would do it. And then, you know, we got to a point, and when when we met, uh, we did the commercials and then kicked in the nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that's all I wanted to do. But then, yeah, once you have kids, kind of all you want to do is, like, be with your kids. 
yeah. until you don't want to be with them. Like they drive yeah. you nuts, and then you do your thing. But it certainly takes the wind out of your ambition sails, or it did for me. And um, you know, so I'm I've dedicated the last twenty years of my life to making family my priority. So I've managed to continue my career on family. It's a whole I, other job. You have to. You are now responsible for someone's life. Yeah. Until they're you know yeah late teens well it's life decisions and priorities the family was my priority when i had a a child all i wanted to do was be a good dad yeah because you know my dad wasn't around a whole lot when i was younger he was around a lot when i had my kids so that was cool um but yeah as someone who has not had kids like i'm still just like yeah i'll come hang out let's let's well that that's fire a doob and yeah Although I'll fire a dupe too. I mean, just <laughs> although it does, things do start to change again when you get to the age where people start dying, like yeah, cancer and like just yeah suicides, and you're just like, oh man, there's a lot more shit going on that I need to. Everybody's deal on their with. own fucking trip. Yeah, I, completely. No matter what, people, whoever is presenting themselves to you, that's not yeah entirely who they oh, are. You know, even close. Yeah. Everybody's Instagram is a projection of what they wish yeah. their life was like all the time. Yeah, it's a commercial not, for your life. They're not showing themselves sitting on the couch crying. Right, or the shot where the chin looks extra doubled and yeah. there's a pimple and, you know. That's the crazy thing. Dude, I've lost 35 pounds. That's how you know you're fat. Like, I've lost 35 pounds and I'm still like, I can't even see it. I'm still fucking. I'm still fucking fat. Keep going, dude. Well, I have to, but yeah. It's weird. <laughs> there was a time like a few years ago when I was, you know, much... I was he- heavy, but not as heavy as I got. Oh, the pandemic, I just stress ate my way through the whole yeah. pandemic because I had so many. I had a bunch of people die that I was close with. and <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. And then, uh, so I just, I gained so much weight over the past three years. And now, like, I've lost 35 pounds, and I'm back to, like, where I was before that, where even before that, I was like, I need to lose, like, 35 pounds. So, All right. Halfway there. All right. Well, do it, man. Okay. I'm sorry I laughed at your friends dying. See, I laugh because it's an abstract notion. I don't know exactly who died or that I'm not hearing a story. It's kind of like when you oh, yeah, yeah. when you make a joke about somebody going home and porking their wife. <laughs> it's not it's it's not funny if you've met their wife cuz then it's yeah. just as weird, but in the yeah. abstract it's like a shit joke. Yeah. I love shit jokes. And occasionally people will send me pictures of actual shit because they'll think I think it's funny and I'm like, "You dumb motherfucker, this is disgusting." I hate that. The abstract is funny. Yes. Um, or some things in the abstract yeah. are funny. I, I agree. I concur. Do you? Concur? I concur. All right. I conquered. I like it. France. Concur. The 1700s. Well, anything else you want to uh, chat about? You doing anything, you know, any, anything you want to? No, just like a lot. I'm at that age now where it's like doctor's appointments after doctor's appointments. Yeah. And after I got back from shooting and, you know, or really after the pandemic kind of slowed down and got boosted and everything i'm now at that point where i'm like well i'm 54 i really i've just started going to all the yeah all the doctor's appointments that you have to do and yeah you know do you enjoy getting a prostate exam (laughs) had one just a month and a half ago nice it was uh it had been a very long time and you're like oh yeah that's uh yep so yeah, that's so, uncomfortable. Circling back to Brian Cranston on the Cleveland Show, his character was Doctor Fist, who was Cleveland's primary care that's physician. Right. So, anyway, there you go. Um, all right, man. Well, let's uh, let's fucking let's blow this popsicle stand. Let's huh? do it. Let's what is party. that? What does that mean? Blow this popsicle, popsicle stand. stand. And I, is it clearly that came out in a, probably the fifties when? People actually went to popsicle stands, right? Or did it? Would they just pretend to be blowing a popsicle? Maybe that. But then it. the stand—you wouldn't blow the stand. Were there popsicle stands? I don't know. I'm not that old, Steve, and neither are you. Thank God. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Steve Agee.